Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the 2016-17 Imprint Margaret Root Brown Reading Series. This podium is moving slightly. I'm not going to touch it anymore. My name is Rich Levy. I'm Executive Director of Imprint, and we are delighted to have you here in the beautifully updated Alley Theater. What a great space, huh? It's gorgeous. Thank you. Since 1980, this series has presented more than 350 leading writers from 28 countries. All of this feeds our love of great books. For folks like us, a little nerdy, who get excited about this sort of thing, the written word is a compulsion that imparts things about ourselves, each other, and the world. Thank you for making it all possible here in Houston. Now, tonight, we are honored and thrilled to welcome Lauren Groff and Ann Patchett to Houston. And to, I should say, this is Ann's third appearance in the series. She previously shared with us Truth and Beauty and Run, for which we are deeply grateful. And we hope Lauren will return again with future books. A little bit about what's coming up next. On November 21st, Rabi Alamadine and Juan Gabriel Vasquez. Rabi with his new novel, The Angel of History, and uh, Juan Gabriel with his novel, New in English Translation. Individual tickets for these readings, Gonsai Pardlo, Com Toibin, A Feast of Great Writing. Five dollars, they go fast, so please buy yours early. All the details plus many distracting links are at imprinthouston.org. As if you needed another excuse. You are also invited to the Imprint Book Club Sunday, November 13th, 4 p.m. at Imprint House to discuss Lauren Groff's Fates and Furies. And on Sunday, December 11th, same time and place to talk about Ann Patchett's comment in your program and on our website, also on imprinthouston.org. You can join our email list, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. The Imprint Margaret Root Brown Reading Series is presented by Imprint in association with Brazos Bookstore and the University of Houston Creative Writing Program. This series is made possible by the generous support of the Brown Foundation and named for one of its founding trustees, Margaret Root Brown. The series is also underwritten by Weatherford International and the National Endowment for the Arts, which affirms that art works. We ever had Anne's and Lauren's publishers, and United Airlines, MM Properties, and Wim Park for their in-kind support. Imprint receives funding from the City of Houston through the Houston Arts Alliance and from the Texas Commission on the Arts. And as always, we owe big thanks to our season ticket buyers. And tonight we are excited to be live streaming this reading in collaboration with Houston Public Media, to whom we are deeply grateful. We're anxious to share the genius of these great writers, and we'll be live streaming all five readings from the be with us tonight or are elsewhere in the world. You can let them know that they can join us via links on imprinthouston.org and houstonpublicmedia.org slash imprint. And thanks also to our great friends at the Alley Theater for helping to make this possible. After the reading tonight, Lauren and Anne will have a conversation here on stage with fiction writer Amber Dumont, an associate professor of English at Rice University. And then we'll move out to the lobby by the bar for a book sale and signing. Brazos Bookstore offers discounts on books by all of the in-print series authors. Tonight, they have signed copies of Commonwealth and fates. So please set your cell phones on stun or silent mode. Photos, no recording except for those authorized to do so. Thank you. Great writers, I promise I'll get out of the way. Our good fortune is having them here with us tonight. The reception Lauren Groff's Fates and Furies has received is thrilling from all the many award nominations and best book lists, including President Obama's best book of 2015. Yes. <laughs> to, re to responses like this from is not only beautiful and vigorous, own heroic registrate Furies for NPR's Morning Edition Book Club said, Fates and Furies is a stunning 360 degree modern view of a complex, incredibly ambitious work. She writes like her hands are on fire. 
It's wonderful to see Ann Patchett's new novel, Commonwealth, at the top of the New York Times bestseller list. Janelle Brown in the Los Angeles Times calls it a beautiful puzzle box of a book, one that doesn't clearly fit together until all of a sudden, midway through, it does. Unpretentious, ultimately heartbreaking, miniature supporting experience. Tom Beer in Newsday writes, Patchett's slyly knowing voice, full of wit and warmth, elevates every page of this novel, one that through the alchemy of her writing, somehow feels more than the sum of its parts. Please join me in giving a crazy warm Houston welcome to these two brilliant, fearless, essential writers. First up, Lauren Groff. I've been in uh, Houston for approximately two hours, but I, I love it. Um, and I've been here before. It's a great city, and it's a very literary city, which you, don't, you can't say about all that many cities in the United States of America. Um, I am just going to, to read a couple of parts from Fates and Furies, but before I do so, I, I would love to establish a little bit what I was thinking going into writing this book. Um, because a few years. So when I when I, I started this book in the middle of writing my last book, Arcadia. Now Arcadia is very very different. All my books are incredibly different from one another. Arcadia was um, about um, bringing children into a flawed and dark world uh, because that's what I was doing at the time. I was having babies, um, and you know climate change is really scary. Um, and, and it felt as though at the time, um, you know, I, I try not to, to write out of pain, but it, it wasn't painful to write, but it wasn't um, a joyous event to, to sit down at my desk every day. Partially because uh, I live in Florida and I write in this studio that is not air conditioned. Um, um, and I have these little pet anoles that sort of dart in and out of my, it's, it's gross, but also kind of great. Um, and so I was writing it, and it, it was hard. It was a hard, hard book to write. So I decided that in the middle of writing this, I was going to write another book also. And this other book was going to be full of everything that Arcadia wasn't full of. Um, sex, uh, joy, color, opera. You know, I wanted to make this book so different. Uh, so what I did is I put these huge pieces of butcher paper on both walls. I knew that I wanted to write about marriage because um, I apparently can only write about one thing, which is community. Um, and I went from all, every one of my books goes into smaller and smaller communities. And finally, I, I could only write about the smallest possible community as a community of two in an intimate partnership. Um, and. On, on these pieces of butcher paper, I would, you know, in the middle of a really, really hard section of Arcadia, I would stand up and write um, a part of the, the wife's story. Not hard, it was this big. Um, and then write the husband in, in joy and um, just having a great time. I put up pictures, I drew maps, you know. I, I was like a, like a serial killer um, plotting out her, her thing. Um, and it was so much fun. Um, and so I think of that as the first draft of this book writing at the same time as Arcadia. And then I sat down and wrote in many other drafts. Um, so what I wanted to do was talk a lot about um, privilege. I wanted to talk about the privileges inherent in the institution of marriage. Uh, I wanted to talk about well, who gets to become an artist in this world, uh, and why, and what it takes to, to proclaim oneself an artist. Um, and in this case, the, the man in this book, it, his name is Lotto, he's the artist. Um, in, his, in his case, it takes a great deal of narcissism, um, which is probably the same in my family, too. I'm the artist, my husband's not. Um, uh, so, so you know, throughout the writing of this book, I just I had the best time. Um, and um, I'm going to read to you a little bit from both parts of the book. The first part of the book is from the, the husband's point of view. And the um, second part of the book spins everything around and comes from the, the wife's point of view. Um, now, I know that I... Um, 
I, I'm supposed to give the page numbers for those of you at home. Uh, I'm going to start on page 98, but do know that I have read this book in many, many places, countries, and I usually have a pen in my hand, and so I edit while I'm reading. Um, so it's not, what I'm reading is not exactly what you're going to read. <laughs> okay, so I'm starting on page 98. Here we go. After the incomprehension and the raw fish came the long flight, then the short. At last, home. He sat watching through the window as the staircase approached the plain over the sun-shot asphalt. Spring rain had blown through as they taxied in, and just as swiftly was gone. He wanted his face in Matilde's neck, the soothe of her hair. Two weeks as playwright in residence in Osaka, and as long as he'd ever been away from his wife. Too much. The rolling staircase fumbled and missed the door three times before it clicked in. Eager as a virgin. Thank you. <laughs> Nobody else laughs at that. How lovely to stretch this long body of his, to stand and breathe for a few moments at the top of the stairs, savoring the oil and manure and ozone smell of dinner. His happiness stretched out its wings and gave a few flaps. He hadn't accounted for the other passengers' impatience. It wasn't until he was already midair that he felt the hand hard in the middle of his back. How outrageous, he thought, pushed. Now the pavement was billowing up toward him like a flicked tablecloth. One distant windsock tonguing eastward, the crenellated roof of the airport building, a shine of the sandpapery steps in the sunlight, the plane's nose somehow peeling into his vision and the pilot stretching his arms in the window. And Lancelot had it twisted entirely around by the time his right shoulder hit the edge of a stair and he was looking at his ostensible pusher looming out of the dark cave mouth at the top. A man with tomato-colored hair and face, lines on bust on his forehead, wearing madras shorts of all ugly things. Lancelot's head hit the tread somewhat lower, and things kind of the minutes exercising his old actor's charm on her. Brief fantasy with her with skirt up, legs around his waist in the plastic bathroom before he banished the image. He was married and faithful, and she was in the process of putting her hands slowly up to her mouth as his body made a satisfying thunkada thunkada rhythm and sliding downward, and he kicked out toward the rail the instinct to stop his fall, but felt a curious sharp clicking in the shin region, and all in that general direction went numb. With delicious slowness, he came to rest in a shallow puddle, his shoulder and ears seeping up the sun-warmed water, his legs still extended up the stairs, though his foot, it appeared, canted outward in a manner unbefitting its owner's dignity. Down now, the tomato-headed man was coming, a moving stop sign. His footsteps rocked some locus of pain in Lancelot. When the man was close, Lancelot held up the hand that wasn't numb, but the man stepped over him. Lancelot got a flash of the tube of his shorts, hairy white thigh, dark genital tingle. Then the man was running over the shining asphalt swallowed up by the slab of a terminal door. The flight attendant's face came into view, soft cheeks and hoarse nostrils blowing, and he closed his eyes as she touched his neck and someone somewhere began to shout. Backlit, the fracture was tectonic, the plates of him overlapping. He was given two casts, a sling, a crown of gauze, pills that made his body feel as if it were encased in three inches of rubber. As if, had he been on the same drugs when he fell, he would have hit his asphalt, only to bounce delightedly high, startling pigeons midair, set out to earth, wind, and fire all the way to the city. <laughs> Mattel let him eat two donuts and his eyes filled with tears because they were the most amazing donuts in the history of glazed donuts, food of the gods. He was full of joy. They would have to spend the summer in the country, alas. His play, wall, ceiling, floor was in rehearsal and he should be there for it, but really there was so little he could do. He couldn't climb the stairs of the rehearsal space and it would be an abuse of power to make his dramaturg carry him. He couldn't even climb the stairs to their tiny apartment. He sat on the building staircase looking at the pretty black and white tiles. 
back and forth, Matilda went, gathering the food, the clothes, everything they needed from the apartment on the second floor down to the car, double parked in the street. Ch stuck her shy brown head out the door and looked at him. What hose, Bratling, he said to the kid. She stuck a finger in her mouth and took it out, all wet. What is that nutty Bobo doing out there on the stairs? She said, tiny echo of some adult. Lancelot brayed and the building manager peered out a bit more ruddy than normal and took a look at the casts, the sling, the crown. He nodded at Lancelot, then pulled his kid and head inside and shut the door fast. In the car, Lancelot marveled at Mathilde. What a smooth face she had, lickable, like a vanilla ice cream cone. If only the left side of his body hadn't suddenly become buried in concrete, he would leap over the emergency brake and treat her the way a cat. <laughs> Kids are jerks, he said. Ma'am, maybe now that you're my nurse for the rest of the summer, you can have free license with my body, and, and all the lust and frenzy will beget a sweet wee thing. They weren't using birth control, and there was no question that either one of them was defective. It was clearly a matter of luck and time. When he wasn't high, he was more careful, kept quiet, sensitive to the stoic longing he had felt in her whenever he brought it up. Those drugs of your spectacular, she said, they seem pretty spectacular. It's time, he said, it's more than time. We've got some cash now, house, you're ripe still. Your eggs may be getting a little wrinkly, I don't know. Forty. We're risking some springs going sprung in the kid's head. Though it may not be so bad to have a dumb kid. Smart ones are off as soon as they're able to escape. Dumbos stick around longer. <laughs> On the other hand, if we wait too long, we'll be cutting his pizza for him until we're 93. No, we got to do this thing ASAP. As soon as we get home, I'm going to impregnate the heck out of you. <laughs> Most romantic thing you've ever said to me, she said. Down the dirt road, up the gravel drive, graceful dripping limbs of cherry trees. Oh gosh, they lived in the cherry orchard. He stood at the back door watching Mathilde open the French door to the veranda, go down the grass to the new and sparkling pool. There were two tanned and muscled men gleaming in the last sun, unrolling a strip of sod. Mathilde in her white dress, her cropped platinum hair, her slim body, the sunburst guy, the shining muscle men. It was unbearable. Tableau vivant. He sat suddenly. A hot dampness overcame his eyes. All this beauty, the stun of his luck. Also, the pain that had just surfaced, a nuclear submarine out of the deep. OK, so that's Lotto. Um, he's, he, you know, he's nuts. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Aww. Little of Mathilde, um, if you don't like um, swear words, go like this when I, when I do that, all right? There's, they're, they're not that bad. Um, okay, so so in Matilda's section, I wanted to, to so okay in Lotto's section, what, what I wanted to do really badly was to play around a lot with narrative structures that have been traditionally masculine. Um, I wanted to, to think through this idea of this man who who considers himself in narrative terms through the Kunstler Roman, the Bildungsroman, um, the epic poetry, uh, courtly romance, the opera, all of these ways that have that stories have been told through literary history in terms of the masculine. And in Matilda's section, I wanted to take this like over overblown um, guy's idea of himself and sort of take little pins and puncture. Um, so this is what Mathilde's doing in her second part of the book. One day when Mathilde was walking in the village where they'd been so happy, she heard a car full of boys drive up behind her. They were yelling lewd things. Anatomy, they suggested she suck. What they'd like to do to her ass as if she'd drunk a tumbler of whiskey down. It's true, she thought. I still have a perfect ass. But when the car drew level to her face, the boys went dumb. She saw them pale in passing. They gunned the engine and were gone. This moment returned to her a month later when she crossed a Boston street and heard someone calling her name. A small woman darted up. Mathilde couldn't place her. She had damp eyes and hair hanging round her ears. Soft at the midsection, a breeder. From the looks of things, four little girls and matching Lily Pulitzer were at home with the au pair. The woman stopped five feet from Mathilde with a little cry. Mathilde brought her hands to her cheeks. I know, she said. I've looked so old ever since my husband. She couldn't finish the sentence. 
No, the woman said. You're still elegant, it's just, you look so angry, Mathilde. Later, Mathilde would remember. With the recollection came some small pang of guilt. For a breath, she studied the sidewalk waltz of chickadee and sun through windblown leaves. When she looked up again, the other woman took a step back, then another. Slowly, Mathilde said, angry. Sure. Well, what's the point in hiding it anymore? And then she lowered her head, pressed on. It would come to her decades later when she was old and a porcelain bathtub had a loft on lion claws and her own body mercifully submerged that her life could be drawn in the shape of an X. Her feet duck splayed and reflected in the water. From a terrifying expanse in childhood, life had focused to a single red-hot point in middle age. From there, it had exploded outward again. She slid her heels apart so they were no longer touching. The reflection moved with them. Now her life showed itself to have been a different shape, equal and opposite to the first. Complex armatilde, she can bear contradictions. Now, the shape of her life appeared to be greater than white space, less than. Thank you. Hey. I'm very happy to be back. Glad they asked me back. Um, I'm going to read a scene, and they're there's no setting it up. Um, it's from page 83, and basically, you're not going to follow it. Just go with the flow. Just enjoy it. There are six kids from two marriages, a set of two, a set of four. They've gone on vacation with their parents, the mother of one, the father of one, and they've gone to a lake, and the parents have left them a note saying that they uh, are going to sleep in, and there will be no lake. Jeanette lifted her eyes from the toast, let's go, that she had said since they left Arlington the day before, and so that settled it. Why should they wait for the parents to wake up? When they did go out, the parents, the children, were divided into two groups, the big kids, Cal, Caroline, and Holly, and the little kids, Jeanette, Franny, and Albie. The big kids were allowed to wander off, swim in deep water without their life jackets, hike past anyone's view, and decide what they wanted for lunch. The little kids might as well have been tied to a tree and made to eat from a single dish. <laughs> the little kids were never to be trusted. With no further discussion, the six of them decided it was better to see this as an opportunity. At the cash register, they added a six pack of coke. How far is it to the lake? Holly asked the waitress who was ringing them up. Two miles, a little less. You just get back on Route 98. What if you walk? The waitress studied the children for a minute. So many of them looked to be exactly the same size. Franny and Jeanette were 38 days apart in age. Where are your parents? <sighs> Getting dressed. Caroline said in the voice of a bored child, they want us to walk together. They said it was good directions. The other children beamed at her for the weight cut if you walk. On one end of the placemat, she drew a rectangle to represent the motel, which she labeled P. Pinecone. And on the other end, a circle for the lake, L. A broken line she drew to connect the two was their ticket out. In the parking lot, Cal tried all the doors to the locked station wagon. Franny asked him what he needed out of the car, and he said, something, mind your own business. He cupped his hands around his eyes and peered in the window, trying I can break in, Caroline said, if it's something you really need. Liar, Cal said, not bothering to look at her. I can, she said, and then she pointed at Jeanette, go get me a coat hanger out of the closet. It was true, very summer, 
Their uncle Joe Mike had locked his keys in Aunt Bonnie's car, and when they were at their grandparents' house that last weekend, and their father had unlocked the door with a coat hanger to save Joe Mike the $12 it would have cost to call a locksmith. After that fix had both of the girls practice because they were interested, he said it was a good thing to, to know. The mistake people make is that they think that you're supposed to pull up on something and you're not. You push down, he told them. Caroline set apart untwisting the wire hanger. That was the hardest part. You're wasting time, Cal said. Whose time, Holly said. If you're in such a hurry, go. She was curious. And it was plain to all of them that Cal was curious, too. Albie walked in wide circles around the car, swinging his hips from side to side, doing the boom-boom thing. Pipe down, Cal said to him. If you wake Dad up, he'll take your head off. That was when the rest of them remembered whose room the car was parked in front of and made a point to be quiet. Caroline picked back the rubber seal at the bottom of the window with her pointer finger and stuck the coat hanger in while the other children pressed close to watch. Caroline was a little worried that the different locks could be different from one car to another. The station wagon was an Oldsmobile, and Aunt Bonnie's car was something else, a Dodge, maybe. The tip of her tongue pushed up at the corner of her mouth while she guided the coat hanger blindly towards what her father called the sweet spot, about ten inches down from the button lock. Then she felt it, the wire against the mechanism of the lock. She didn't try to hook it, though the temptation was there. It was just a little bump, and she pushed straight down the way she had been taught. The lock popped up. It was a victory for all the girls that they remembered not to scream. Car Caroline pulled the coat hanger out and opened the door like it was some sort of natural act. Albie put his arms around her waist. You broke the car, he said in a loud whisper that made him sound like a movie gangster. That's right, she said, and gave him the hanger as the morning souvenir. Albie immediately went to the next car and began jamming the hanger down against the window. Oh, what Caroline wouldn't have given to call her father from the motel phone. She wanted him to know what a good job she'd done. Brother and studied it in light of this new potential. You can teach me how to do this, he said either to Caroline or the coat hanger. Only police officers are allowed to do it, Franny said, and their children. Otherwise, you're a criminal. <laughs> I'd be a criminal, Cal said. He slid into the front of compartment. He took out a gun and a fifth of gin, the seal still on. No one was surprised that there was a gun in the car, even though Cal was the only one who had known it was there, and he only knew about it because he'd been nosing around in the glove compartment a few days before when Beverly was in the grocery store and he'd found it, proving, yet again, sometimes a person just has to look. What surprised all of them, though, Cal included, was that Bert had left it in the car. It made them think that there must have been another gun in the motel room. Bert liked a gun in his briefcase, in the nightstand, in the drawer of his office desk. He liked to talk about the criminals he had put away and how a person never knew and how he had to protect his family and how he wasn't going to let the other guy make the first move. But really, it was just that Bert liked guns. The mesmerizing item was the gin. The parents might enjoy a drink every now and then, but it wasn't like they had to take it with them. They had never seen gin in the car before. That was something special. You know you can't take it, Holly said, her eyes cutting back to the door of the parents' room. She was talking about both the gun and the gin. Just in case something happens, Cal said. He put the gun in the brown paper sack along with the candy bars and the Cokes. Gin and candy bars us. She took the bottle from her brother and started work so gently that it finally gave itself up to her little fingernails in a single replaceable piece. 
She put the seal in her coin purse and gave the bottle back to her brother, and then they set out for the lake, Caroline carrying the map. It was hotter than they had expected it to be, though no hotter than it had been the day before or the day before that. The sky was already turning white, clamping a pervasive dullness onto the landscape. Holly scratched at her arms and complained to mosquitoes. The grass in the field across from the motel, the field that the waitress had told them to cut through, came up to their waists and was as high as Albie's chest. But being right up there in it, they could see the tiny flecks of yellow flowers blooming on the stalks. Can you see the lake? Albie asked. He had ketchup smeared across the blue and yellow striped shirt that Beverly had bought for him. His hands were sticky. Stop, Cal said, and put his hand up flat to the sky. They stopped like soldiers all at once. Turn around he said, and they turned around. What's that building right there? Cal was talking to his brother, pointing just across the street. The pine cone, Albie said. And how far did she say it was from the pine cone to the lake? In the quiet, they could hear the cars whizzing past. Deep in the grass, the crickets rubbed their wings together. The birds called out overhead. Two miles, maybe a little less, Franny said. She knew it wasn't her question to answer, but she couldn't stop her. That made her uneasy, the dry weeds pricking at her shins. There was no path through the field. Cal pointed at his brother. It was funny the way he could be so much like his father while being nothing like him at all. Albie? Two miles, Albie said. He started chopping at the ground to swing his arm. So, now you know we are not there and you know I can't see the lake. Cal started walking again and the rest of them pushed ahead. The field was bigger than it had looked from a distance, and after a while they couldn't see the pine cone anymore, and they couldn't see anything else either, just the grass and the washed-out sky. Several members of the party wondered if they were still going in the right direction. Are we there now? Albie said. Shut up, Holly said. A grasshopper the size of a baby's fist jumped up from the dry grass and attached itself to her shirt, and she screamed. Franny and Jeanette moved to the left of the pack, and they ducked down. They were pretty sure that no one else could see them. When they were very close, almost nose to nose, Jeanette smiled at her, and then they popped back up again. Now are we there? Albie hopped forward, both of his feet together, but the distance was thwarted by the density of the grass. He looked back at his brother. Now are we there? Cal stopped again in them. There was still the beaten down vestige of the trail they had made in the grass. Where are we? Albie said. Virginia, Cal said, his voice as tired as an adult's. Shut up. <laughs> I want to carry the gun, Albie asked. People in hell want ice water, Caroline said. <laughs> it was an expression of their fathers. <laughs> Cal's got a gun, Albie sang, his voice surprisingly loud in the open landscape. Cal's got a gun. They stopped again. Cal moved the brown paper bag higher up under his arms. Two swallows came out of nowhere and shot past them. Albie would not stop singing. Jeanette pulled the can of Coke out of her purse. It's too early to drink it, Holly said. She was in the first year of Girl Scouts, and she had read the chapter about survival tactics in the handbook. <laughs> you have to make it last. Jeanette cracked the can open anyway. Watching her drink, they decided that they were thirsty. There'd be more Cokes once they got to the lake. Cal's got a gun, I'll be called, though, with less interest. It was a complete blank. There was she said. <laughs> Cal thought about it for a minute and then nodded his head. 
He reached into his back pocket and pulled out a tiny plastic bag the size of three postage stamps where he kept the Benadryl tablets his mother made him carry for his allergy. They sat down, pushing back the dry grass, and Caroline opened up the brown paper bag. She was very formal about the way she picked up the gun and set it beside her. And then she handed out the Cokes. Cal came behind her and gave everyone two garish pink pills. I shouldn't give you a. But Albie kept his palm up in silent demand until finally Cal sighed and gave him his two. This is what I needed, Holly said once she brought the pills up to her mouth and then brought them down again, pressed beneath her thumb. She took the bottle of gin out of the bag and swigged it like a Coke, but it surprised her. For a second, she almost spit it out, but she managed to keep her lips pressed together. She handed the bottle to her sister. Now I won't mind walking to the lake, Holly said. Jeanette took a hit of gin and coughed. Then she leaned over and gave her pills to Albie. You can have mine. He looked at the two extra pills in his palm. Now he had four. They were so pink in the bright light in the background of so much colorless grass. Why, he said, maybe suspicious, maybe not. Jeanette shrugged. Tic Tacs give me a stomach ache. This was possible. Everything gave Jeanette a stomach ache. That's why she was so thin. Franny watched Caroline, how she pushed the pills into her palm with her thumb and threw back her head as if to swallow them with a big slug of Coke. Caroline was always convincing. Franny could see that she didn't really drink the gin either. Her mouth wasn't open when she tilted the bottle back. But when the bottle came to her, Franny decided that she would compromise, swallow the gin, and palm the pills. The gin could not have surprised her more. Sensation as it went down her throat and through her chest and stomach. It was as hot and bright as the sun settling between her legs, a beautiful sensation as if the burning had brought about a sort of physical clarity. She took a second mouthful before handing the bottle to Albie. Albie drank the most of all. The children didn't mind waiting. Waiting was part of it. It was hot outside and the Coke was still cold. It was nice just to lie there for a while and stare up into the emptiness of the sky, to not have to listen to Albie go on and on about nothing. When they finally got up, Cal put his empty Coke can next to Albie's leg. That's littering, Franny said. We'll pick him up later, he said. We have to come back for him. And so they all left their cans beside Albie, who was sleeping the sleep of four Benadryl and a big slug of gin in the hot morning sun. Cal took back the pills from Holly and his stepsisters and put them into the baggie and put the baggie back in his pocket. The candy bars were starting to melt and the gun was hot from being in the sun and they put them all together back in the bag and headed for the lake. When they got there, the five of them swam out farther than they ever would have been allowed to had the parents been with them. Franny and Jeanette went to look for caves and were taught to fish by two men they met standing off by themselves in a grove of trees on the shore, ho-hos from the bait shop, and had no need to use the gun in the paper bag because no one saw him do it. <laughs> Caroline and Holly climbed to the top of a high rock and leapt into the lake below again and again and again until they were too tired to climb anymore, too tired to swim. All of them were sunburned, but they lay in the grass to dry because none of them had thought to bring a towel, but the drying bored them, and so they decided to head back. Their timing was perfect. Albie was awake, but he was just sitting there in the field, quiet and confused amid the pile of Coke cans, <laughs> trying hard not to cry. He didn't ask them where they were or where they had been, he just got up and followed in the line behind them as they passed. He was sunburned as well. 
It was just past two o'clock in the afternoon. The most was minutes after they got back to the pine cone and stretched out across the girls' beds in their damp swimsuits to watch television, the parents knocked on the door, bashful and apologetic. They couldn't believe how long they slept. They had no idea how tired they must have been. They would take everyone to the movies and out for pizza in order to make it up to them. The cousins' children and the Keating children smiled up with beatific forgiveness. They had done everything they had ever wanted to do. They had had the most wonderful day, and no one even knew they were gone. It was like that for the rest of the summer. It was like that every summer the six of them were together. Not that the days were always fun. Most of them weren't. But they did things, real things, and they never got caught. <laughs> Hi, team. That was a great reading, Lauren. No, Roth. that I was a great that. reading, in Patchett. And <laughs> my friend Jericho always says that every reading is a runway, and I feel like you gave us Linda Evangelista and Naomi Campbell. Ooh, nice. Very important. Who's who? I, you just we, we better, better, <laughs> we don't know. I never, ever read yeah, a little bit to read. Boy, the act of reading your work, is it, is it, you, you're editing as you're reading, are you able to perform it in a way that feels, um, you know, organic and meaningful, or does it just feel like a performance, like just a, like this is for, you know, um, an audience? I go into a fugue state. <laughs> so I, I don't really know. Yeah. Audience. No. I'm, I, this is what I am doing. Mm -hmm. I am doing a show. Yeah. And I put my Ann Patchett suit on, and I do <laughs> my do. show. I have a suit, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is it, it the Lauren Groff suit? Yeah, and you take it off at the end of the night, and then Absolutely. you sit at the edge of your bed like a little larval. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah. it's like that. It's a persona. Yeah. yeah. Yes. It's funny because I, your books are such good company. Um, when I was reading uh, Commonwealth, I felt very connected to this family, the intimacy, um, that obviously comes from something very personal. This is sort of a departure for you. Um, and then uh, it was a conspiracy of a relationship um, in the way that all relationships are sort of a conspiracy. And so I'm wondering, you are writing these very epic, large scale, over the course of you know, a lifetime books, multi-generational. Um, what is your discipline in, in writing these books? What was, the, you know, what was the sort of discipline and what was the sort of key that unlocked the books for you? Please, you first. Um, the discipline is I show up mm -hmm. and sit at my desk on good days and bad days, on days that I write and on days that I don't write, and just keep showing up. Um, and birth to death novel. My, my books had gotten very compressed. Most of them take place in three or four months. Run takes place in 24 hours. So I really wanted to write something over a big span of time. Uh, and I didn't get birth to death, but I got a christening to an, an almost birth to an almost death of somebody else. Um, <laughs> But I think just the idea of saying I wanted to write about kids who are annoying and feral uh, and justifiably messed up and then see how they get older and they lose their way and find their way and lose their way and find their way until they're in their 50s. And that, I think that was it. Once I thought, I just have all the space and time and I want to follow them. Mm -hmm. Um, so I actually, I worked on this book for a long time um, before I was happy with it. And what had happened was, um, I just, I couldn't, I thought I was writing two books, actually. Mrs. Bridge, but, or, <laughs> yeah, the Old Filth trilogy, which I love. Oh, so good. Read Old so Filth. Good. Yeah. Um, also read Mrs. Bridge. Mr. Bridge, you can skip. Um, but 
Um, I, I was saying this as a person who loves those books, but I, I just couldn't do it. And so I would write draft after draft, and I, I write longhand, and I throw the drafts out in between, and then I sit down and write longhand again, and I just couldn't get it. I didn't, I didn't know what was going on. Um, so I actually made a bet with my husband. Um, <laughs> I was close to January 1st of uh, 20, God, when was this? 2014? Is that right? No, 2013. And I and I said, um, I have to write this book. I need to hand you a manuscript by the end of the year. And he said, great, I have this great idea. Um, if you don't, I'm going to take all of your money, and I'm going to invest it in this horrible mutual fund um, <laughs> that is like cigarettes and guns, <laughs> um, like oil, like things that are like I don't really believe in. And so I actually had um, a stake in this, right? Because I needed my money to pay for my children's education <laughs> um, and my part of the mortgage. Um, so, so I worked really hard, and on December 31st, I printed out a copy and finally handed it to him. And it wasn't good, but it was done for Do the moment. Do you know that there yeah. was a question in the ethicist this weekend, this no. Sunday, that was exactly... I, I haven't been home. Is it Come on. Is it ethical to tie um, exactly this, uh, something that you want to do to giving money to a horrible organization if you don't do it. <laughs> well, yeah, it is because uh, it was the bet I was racing against. And I mean, it's ethical, read, right? Read it didn't the happen. It, it's, well, it's if he disagrees, yeah. I, will, I will write to him and I will argue because I would say, it works, it works. It works. It's good. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> well, it's funny, like the idea that your, your husband is, is making this incredible... Um, uh, sort of demand on your conscience, you know, yeah. like to sort of taking you in. I'm wondering, um, both of these... My husband would so yeah. not do that. <laughs> <laughs> My husband would be like, take another 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. Go to a spa. You don't need to do this. <laughs> Relax. Well, it's, it's funny because I do think your books are really in dialogue with each other. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, what did you discover about marriage? What did you discover about female rage in your case. Um, what did you discover about sort of tearing down the, the kind of great man theory of literature? And both of your books have these sort of men who really um, are getting all this acclaim for work that they're barely responsible for. And so I'm wondering, what did you discover about marriage? Like, what, what did these you know, sort of characters give you access to suddenly? So um, I don't. I'm not sure how to answer that question because when I write, I act something I'm very interested in looking at over the course of years because it takes me years to write books, and and all I do is ask lots of questions, and the questions sort of breed in the night, and you wake up the next morning with more questions. You're like, ah, I didn't answer the other questions that I had before, and if I know, let's stop reading. <laughs> um, so it, it becomes this um, this complicated idea that of just by asking questions, you get deeper into the yeah. idea. So so I don't know if I learned anything, to be honest. Um, um, I, I do know that everyone's marriage is deeply um, unique, and uh, you you cannot generalize about marriage, um, and it's something that makes people very angry about. Um, I've, I've been traveling with this book for over a year now, and people are get angry. They get mad about, at you? No, well, They're about the, 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 the subject of marriage. Uh -huh. but, but, it, <gasps> but I feel like mine is a book about divorce. Mm. I meant the other book, but that's cool. Which is, oh, 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 that yeah. book. Yeah, I did. But, and that was about divorce, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Which is a form of marriage. <laughs> I, yeah, when I think about marriage, I think about divorce. Um, <laughs> I really do. <laughs> But to me, it's the book, this book is about following a pretty small random act, a drunken kiss at a party, yeah. through the long-term conclusions and the impact on a huge group of people in a family yeah. and how it just evolves and evolves. And it's not like a terrible thing. It's not like following the gunshot or the murder or anything. It's, it's a kiss. It's a drunk kiss. And, and how it unravels and everything unravels for there. So I don't see it as a book about marriage. I really mm. do see it as a book about the impact of divorce. Well, it's, it felt as though, you know, 
you were almost going chapter by chapter uh, in the way that a, a linked uh, set of stories, like it, it, like it sort of felt just the way that you use time and the way that you were able to um, kind of flash forward, jump forward. Right. And you don't really write short stories. No, not at all. I mean, a couple of people have said that to me, and I've thought, I should have sent those chapters out to magazines. <laughs> I, no, I, I don't write stories at all. Do you write stories? Yeah. Do okay, all right, all right. Oh, you have that book of stories. Yeah. That's right. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. I, I love stories. Yes. I, you, if you held me captive in a room. But you did. I, you did it. But you just didn't know. Right? I, the, the but story. these are no, no. They're really chapters, yeah. and it was it was chapters. If you have eleven main characters and it covers fifty-two years, I think that it, if you're moving back and forth through time, it's that the chapters are very self-contained. But they are really chapters. No, yeah. It's um, it's sort of curious to me to think about um, the female characters who are very much sort of propping up these and you know I think about just um, oh that's true I didn't think mm -hmm. of you know that either. you both have that yeah. um, and I'm wondering about um, how you sort of uh, like what was it that you were um, revealing ultimately about your sort of bigger thoughts on the process of creation you know how art is created. Is it possible for any one person to make anything, or is everybody sort of, you know, every great person has a Vera Nebokov, you know, trailing behind them with a butterfly net? <laughs> um, for me, it was working out. I think my guilt and sense of responsibility about writing this book. I am Leo yeah. Posen and of Franny. I am both sides of the affair. Uh, so the idea is if you take someone else's story that is freely offered up to you, is that a bad thing to do? Is it a wrong thing? When does it become your own story? So for me, the character was really just working it out. But also when I was young, I went to Iowa when I was 21, and I was very shy. I was the person that you would not have seen in the room. And those big, famous, fabulous drunk writers who came yeah. and gave those endless drunken readings mm -hmm. while we sat on the floor. <laughs> we loved them so yeah. much. And, and so it was very easy for me to tap in. I, you know, I think that it's, it's kind of traditional to think, oh, the very young woman is in some way victimized by... But she's the, not. But she's not. She just oh. loves him. You know? She feels so lucky to have been chosen. And those writers, you know, Bello, Updike, those are important writers. Too. Yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. It's a way of sort of honoring the complexity of that. The, the fact that my character sleeps with this guy is my way of honoring I them. Think, yeah. <laughs> It sort of is. You know, I'd go with it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the um, sort of heart of your book is... Just because um, I, I responded to it in yeah. ways, and I was dealing with guilt um, in my own marriage in a lot of ways, too, because I am the writer. My husband is the one taking care of my children right now, right? Um, and he's been the one who's done that all this time. But also... I love him. I, I love him, too. I know. Um, I have a great man story, too. I want to hear it. So I was at um, I was at McDowell, which is a writer's colony, which is amazing. Where um, it's, it's, it's where they, they go. go the it's where all the great writers are. <laughs> uh, and we were drinking a lot of booze. Um, and uh, I sat down, and I was talking to this great writer. I can't tell you his name now, but I'll later. Um, <laughs> And sorry, <laughs> you'll never know, but they <laughs> will. Um, and he truly did turn to me with all earnestness. And like, I, I think he probably would call himself a feminist. He, and he said, you know, I know the history of literature doesn't because be inward and create babies. <laughs> like, like he said this, and I'm, I was raised to be polite. So I, you know. <laughs> 
I looked at him and I was like, well, that's one way to think about it. And I went back to my studio and I sat there burning, right? I have the worst case of staircase sweat ever. I came up with a million things to say to him. But instead of saying it, I actually just passive aggressively put it in a book. Oh, wow. There we go. I so want to drop my glasses on the floor <laughs> so we could both stick our head. Yeah. That's sort of like the ultimate revenge, right? Yeah. This would be useful. Um, Your enemy is from high school. <laughs> people ever read the book? Those people on whom we seek revenge. Well, you have that sort of line about, like, hide all your secrets in a novel. No one, no one ever That's reads them. them. Yes. Put it all in the novel. Who cares? <laughs> I actually think it's the opposite. When you do overtly put things into the novel, nobody sees it. But when you don't mean to put anything at all, people are like, I know who these characters are. And you're like, no, no, I yeah. didn't mean that at all. But right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just sort of funny. Um, the... <laughs> The way that um, you know th your female characters sort of take on, um, in a very like in both cases, I think in a very complex way, uh, the you know being something beyond being amused and being kind of angry about the the limitations that they have. I mean, we live in the position of uh, you know the the place that someone like. Hillary Clinton has. Um, when you when you were writing, um, did you feel as though uh, this was this was a territory that you had something uh, new to say about beyond just this like um, men are bad, women are doing everything? Like, how did you? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> thinking about that like, was really it for me. I <laughs> Again, this act of discovery. Like, yeah. if you think about the novel as an act of discovery, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, as you were writing a sort of like this kind of marvelous um, writing in longhand and then not being able to like actually read your own writing. Mm -hmm. And so there's that kind of relationship between uh, the sort of translating, uh, you know, the, the sort of larger macro idea into the narrative, mm -hmm. into like the actual sort of. Um, the heart of the story. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to, I think, for me, um, inspiration in a lot of ways. And Stacey Schiff's amazing biography of Vera Nabokov, um, which um, was a huge, huge inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, that, that book in particular, um, it's infuriating. I love Nabokov. I think he's one of my top five writers. Um, you know, the Speak Memory in particular is my, my favorite of his books. Um, but if you look at the lives of these mm -hmm. writers, he really did buy into this myth of the single, yeah. you know, genius who arises out of nowhere. When Vera actually did everything for him, <laughs> even maybe even writing his lectures when he oh. lectured at Cornell, you know, she but but she never 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 took on. Um, any credit. I mean, she she just refused it. And in fact, when um, there are these interviews, she would be in the room, but she would refuse to speak uh, because it was the the Vladimir show. Mm. Um, and that you know that that bugs me. And when I started reading, I read a lot of biographies of playwrights and and great men, um, and I just kept seeing this figure of the wife in the shadows, and it made me so sad um, uh, because. It, it, it's not the truth that we come out of nowhere, right? It, and it, nobody comes out of nowhere. The idea that I was trying to get at with this book is that we're all dependent on so many invisible forces in our lives, right? Nobody builds a business out of nowhere. We rely on an educated workforce and roads, right? And so, and so to have um, female rage, um, bringing it back to this idea, um, I wanted the, this person to to contain within herself the awareness that um, she was essential, right, in in this in this partnership, um, but to feel constrained by that. And so, I, you know, I was I was seeing this figure as someone who was under a great deal of pressure from society and from her marriage and what she was expected to do. And that's where I just saw her as a pressure cooker in a lot of ways. Um, so that's where the, the inspiration for that came from. Mm. But go ahead and, yeah. Well, I, yeah. I think of it not in terms of the artist yeah. and the support. I think of it in terms of like 
life. Right? Yeah, me too. You know, my life as a woman. Um, and it, that it seems, maybe it's just me, but that the senior female in any household is responsible for everything. Yes. That's been my experience. And it doesn't, you don't have to be married to a great novelist to feel like that's your lot. And I did an interview a couple of days ago with a Buddhist magazine called The Lion's Roar, which used to be Shambhala magazine. And the woman who was interviewing me was asking me about this question. And she said, talk about the, the sort of the sort of split between the desire to serve, which is the basis of all religion, and the desire to not be squashed, which is the dream of all women. Um, and, and I said, I feel caught exactly in the middle of that because by the Sisters of Mercy, I love these women so much who are now in their late 80s, and they are the happiest, best people that I know, and they've done nothing but serve. Mm -hmm. I was raised to do nothing but serve, and I think it is the best part of who I am as a person. And I think if I could get over it, I might be Tolstoy. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. So, if anybody can solve that problem for me. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm thinking about... She has a husband that... <laughs> I iron my husband's handkerchiefs. I make Stop dinners. Stop doing that. He, he Stop. never asked me. do it. He never asked me. I make dinner seven nights a week. He has a really hard job. I, okay. I, if I am knocking myself out going crazy, I work four hours a day. Unless I'm on book tour. Mm -hmm. And he works 12 hours a day saving human lives. It's hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyway. I can't, I can't figure it out. Okay. You're both tremendous advocates for, um, for the literary arts. You own a bookstore, and you're uh, constantly advocating for new authors. You're one of, I think, our, our great uh, take on very difficult books. And I'm wondering, um, how, do you, how do you feel about the relationship between uh, in your case, was sort of like reviewing and writing, and then what is your sort of advocacy? How is that a part of your writing? Oh, okay. Um, you know, it's all a matter of balance, and I think that I, I, maybe possibly a lot of things that we're talking about tonight are um, trying to find the balance. Um, and I know that if I, I'm, as a female writer, you really can only choose like two things and you can do them really really well but as soon as you start adding more things um, you just won't do them well um, and she said well choose your two things and I said okay I'm going to be a mother and I'm going to be a writer and those are the two things that I can do but you can't be a mother 24 hours a day because your kids go to school right and you can't be a writer 24 hours a day because like you I can only really work four hours, um, and then my brain stops functioning. Um, it's to seek out, you know, new projects or um, in the world. And I don't do as much as Ian does. I don't have a bookstore. I would love to have one. But instead, I, you know, I try to blurb other people's books and I do reviewing. Um, and it's really, really, really hard to be a novelist in review books um, because there are ethical dilemmas sure. um, involved in doing it, right? Because you are engaged in, in critically looking at someone else's work um, and you know that you have in your body to the, to the, um, the process. Uh, so it's just emotionally exhausting. And it's it basically, um, I, I try to give to the sort of work as much as I have, but I don't, I don't do it all that often. I, you know, I do maybe four reviews a year mm. maximum because I don't have the, the, the spare empathy, honestly. Yeah. 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 Um, I have found that I really love business and that I'm really a writer and I have been supported in my professional life by the publishing industry and by bookstores, independent bookstores, all bookstores. And 
it's very important to me that this ecosystem lives. If this system, you know, I am a fish in the pond. If the pond dies, I die. So there's a certain amount of self-interest in it all, but just really interest. I want to keep this system going, and I feel like authors have been orchids in a hothouse for a long time, and that we need to be more responsible and open our eyes and abdicate industry in all sorts of different ways. Mm -hmm. Keeping the publishing industry healthy. People say to me, you don't have to do these giant book tours anymore. Your books are going to sell. And I really understand. Before I opened a bookstore and I would go to a bookstore and do an event and sell a bunch of books and the bookstore owners would come up to me and say, thank you so much for flying to Detroit and doing this event. We appreciate it. And I would be like, yeah, sure, of course, I'm so happy to. And it really wasn't until I opened a store that I thought, oh my God, this is how you guys make payroll. Mm. This is how you pay your rent. It's when authors come and do big events and sell lots of books. Buy your books here tonight from this wonderful independent bookstore that is selling them. Not only are they a wonderful independent day, and they are fabulous, but they are the booksellers in your community. So if you decide that you want to save a couple of bucks and get your book from Amazon, what happens is that you take that money out of the tax base of your community. So even if you aren't interested in having local independent bookstores, you might be interested in things like firefighters and teachers. The reason it seems that it's my responsibility to say that. And I go all over the place making sure that people really understand that if you want to keep not just book selling, but if you want to keep your communities, you really need to support your communities. This is how you do it. It's beautiful. I guess before we go, could you each sort of recommend um, a book? Could you do that? Oh or two? Okay, this is hard. Go, you go. Um, <laughs> I read so many, but it's hard to come up with something on the spot. Okay, um, I'll tell you a book that I... Um, Houston next week, Beverly Lowry, wrote a book called Who Killed These Girls? And it's about the yogurt shop murders in Austin in 1991. Let me tell you, before I opened a bookstore, I used to read Henry James. I've read The Awkward Age three times, I kid you not. I read things I never would have touched if I didn't have a bookstore because things keep coming at me from all directions. True crime, not my thing. Brutal murder of four teenage girls, not my thing. This book is so well written. It is so smart. It is in cold blood for our age. Sensational or sentimental in it. It is the telling of this incredibly complicated story that is not only about the loss of the lives of these four girls, but about the loss of the lives of the four young men who confessed to the murders under enormous duress eight years later and made false confessions and then were later exonerated by DNA. Please, please go and make sure that you ask your bookseller as you're going out when Beverly's gonna be there because I know it's in a couple of days and you don't wanna miss the event and it would be so cool if this many people showed up for her. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, I'm gonna recommend two books that I've new and one's old, um, but um, the, the new book is a book of poetry. I read a lot of poetry. Um, it's Ocean Vuong's Night Sky with Exit Wounds. It's just stunning. It's a stunning sign. He's about three years old. Um, he's so young and so beautiful and so wonderful. It's such a great book. And the other book that's relatively old is um, Jane Smiley's The Greenlanders. 
Mm. And it's just, I mean, this book blew my mind, it's and I can't book. stop thinking about it, particularly in terms of climate change, uh, because it's about what happens to Greenland. And nobody really knows, but I think Jean Smiley basically wrote um, the, just a prophecy. I don't know. She, she channeled someone who had lived there. Um, it's so good. It's a great, great book. It just haunts me. It's it so is good. a great book. Yeah. Did you read it? Yeah, I love like Elder Darkness. Yeah. I know that um, you're going to be signing books. May I tell you how? Yes, Anne, please oh, tell please us. Oh, please tell us, Anne. So, I am now here in the role as a bookstore owner and somebody who conducts, well, I mean, not personally, but we have over 300 events a night, a year, not a night. <laughs> Scratch that. I have been on book tour since 1992, and I have been trying to crack the code of how to conduct a signing since 1992, and I figured it out this year, and it has worked in every city. So this is how it goes. One, we've both signed books in advance, so there are signed copies if you want to take one and go. When I was on book tour and I was in London, and I took a train to some small city, and there were 300 women there, and at the end of the talk, I had to sign their books and then take the last train back to London where my husband and my suitcase and my toothbrush were all together. And I realized there was no way in the world I was going to get all of these books signed and get back on the train. But the is that all of these people, who were all women, lined up, and they opened their books, and they said, thank you for coming, Joan. Lovely presentation, Sarah. <laughs> thank you so much, Emily. And I signed 300 books in 35 minutes, and I made the train. I have been giving this talk every night, and every night it works perfectly. And suddenly, we don't all have to be here until 2 o'clock in the morning. We don't want to be here. You don't want to be here. One night on my book tour that I didn't give this talk, it was in Princeton, New Jersey. really obligated to go to one Barnes & Noble for every book tour. Long may they live, Barnes & Noble. <laughs> and there were 80 people there. I didn't give my little talk. And this is what happened. Every single person who came up to me in line said some variation of this. So. I was reading State of Wonder when my daughter was applying to medical school last summer and she didn't get in because she failed in organic chemistry and I told her she should take it again in summer school but she didn't want to. So what I want to know from you is should she sit out a year and reapply next fall or should she consider going to become a doctor of osteopathy is somehow not really as much as being an MD and would she feel like, and I thought I'm going to kill myself. But what happens is then the person behind Crazy Town thinks, well, Crazy Town got 12 minutes of her life. I'm going for my 10 minutes. All right, here's the other thing you have to know. Lauren, would you? Gladly. I have a 15-year-old flip phone. It doesn't take pictures, and it doesn't shoot documentary films. You guys all have iPhones. This is the other thing that happens on book tour now. There are going to be 600 people, and they all want to do this. <laughs> and then they hand their phone to another person. And the other person who also has an iPhone, but it isn't that iPhone. They can't figure out how to make it work. And I'm still holding this person who I don't know. And then they're saying, what's the code? Wait, is there a flash on this thing? <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I... Yeah. Thank you. Um, I can't do it anymore. So, I have come up with... You may photograph the zebras all you want, but you may not get out of the Jeep. <laughs> and you may not touch us. Thank you very much. <laughs>